the so-called unsinkable Titanic striking an iceberg and plunging into the North Atlantic. Of the 2,200 people on board, 1,500 were killed. It had been a high-priced, high-society voyage. Ten of the passengers millionaires, and in the ship's vaults, seven million dollars in diamonds. The latest effort to locate the remains has been a joint French-American project using a remote-controlled, camera-equipped submarine. And early yesterday, the mission reported that the wreckage of the Titanic had finally been found. So there it is down below in the ocean, two miles, waiting all of these years, and we want to have a look at this find. We're going to talk with one of the survivors of the ta Titanic, Eva Hart, seven years old at the time. Her father died in the sinking while she and her mother survived. She joins us from our London Bureau, and here in New York is John Eaton. He is the historian for the Titanic Historical Society, now writing a book about that tragedy at sea. Thank you both for joining us. And Mr. Eaton, you think about that remarkable piece of business here this ship has lain all these years so far down. Ten millionaires on board, gala events going on, and diamonds in the safe. Can that be found down there? Uh, not too likely. Uh, the, from what I've been advised, the debris is scattered over a fairly wide area. It's what they call a debris trail. And uh, you'd have to get some kind of vacuum cleaner down there, which at the depth is uh, fairly improbable. What is down there? Uh, at the moment, it just appears to be fragments of the ship which broke up as the ship impacted with the bottom of the, uh, of the ocean bed. Uh, based on some tests that the U.S. Navy did uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they found that at that depth, the uh, vessel would strike at the equivalent of about 100 miles an hour. And uh, that would mean just uh, total destruction of most of the equipment and furnishings and things of that sort. So salvage operators who were thinking about all the incredible wealth that might lie down below there are kidding themselves? Uh, there may be techniques developed in some future period that would enable them to get down there and uh, work with square foot. All right, we have seen pictures of, of the remarkable Titanic and Ms. Hart is in London. You remember that night very well, don't you, Miss Hart? I do indeed. Could you tell us where you were and what you experienced just as it struck the iceberg? Well, quite obviously, I was in bed and asleep, as any seven-year-old child would be. But, you see, my mother refused to go to bed in that ship because she had this premonition, um, solely based on the fact that she said that to declare a vessel unsinkable was flying in the face of God. And so she was awake, and the moment she felt this impact, which she always declared wasn't very much from where our cabin was, she immediately wakened me and my father. So the first I remember of that actual night, of course, was being taken out of bed, my father carrying me up onto the deck. But young as I was, I had a, a most peculiar feeling about it because of my mother's intense unhappiness before we sailed and even when we were on board. I, is it true, Ms. Hart, that as the rescue efforts were going on, that women and children were to be saved, that the men, some of them, dressed in white ties so that they would go down like gentlemen in the band played? I have heard this said. I have no comment to make on it because I didn't see it. And I refuse to believe it was a band. It was a few musicians because it wasn't a very loud music. And I'm quite sure it wasn't a whole band. But this business of the men in their evening dress, I can say nothing about. I didn't see them. You made it to, you made it to a, a lifeboat and watched the ship go down, I presume. Well, my father put my mother and I into a lifeboat because we were on deck in plenty of time to get into a boat. And I didn't sleep the whole night. I saw that ship sink. I saw all the horror of it sinking, and I heard even more dreadful the, the cries of drowning people. And I was completely wide awake the whole night. Now, all these years later, Ms. Ms. Hart, you see that there are people who are talking about salvage operations, and there are still others who say that it should be left as an historical site. What are your views? And I don't say it should be left as a historical fact. I say it should be left because it's my father's grave. But if it is going to aid science tremendously or prove how clever we are by raising the Titanic, well, then nothing I say will stop them doing it. I only have the personal feeling of a woman 
whose whole life was altered and whose father was drowned that night when he needn't have been if there'd been enough lifeboats. And for that reason, I think it should be left where it is. Mr. That's Eden, only my opinion. Mr. Eden, you, you have studied the history of this moment. Is there any historical reason to spend all the money, all the time, and take the risks to try to raise this vessel? This, uh, I believe, as Eva has just said, is a matter of proving capacity for accomplishment. Uh, there, there seems to be at the moment, uh, I, I've been reading recently about the use of metallic uh, objects or metal that has never been exposed to atomic radiation. Uh, heaven knows there's enough of that down there, even in small pieces, and uh, I understand there's value to that type of metal in the manufacturing. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't offset the cost. I doubt it very much, and unless they, someone was willing to pay for it. And the historical significance would not be so great for what would, would actually be brought up? No, no, I, I don't believe so. But this is a matter mainly of accomplishment. Ms. Hart, you, of course, yes. have the moment of remembering your father's courage as he worked so desperately to save you and your mother. You hold yes. that with you, I'm sure, don't you? I do indeed, yes. I have no knowledge of the science of which Jack speaks. Uh, I bow to his superior knowledge. But when I am asked, do I, as a, a simple individual, want to see the Titanic raised, do I want to see her again? And the answer is a very firm no. But, of course, my mother always held that when that ship was, well, when her bows were down, her stern was up in the air, which was, as you see, these dreadful pictures, my mother always declared that that dreadful noise we heard, which I heard, which was like a big explosion, caused that ship to just break a, in half. Just a moment. She always said that. Thank you very much, Miss Hart, for talking with us. And Mr. Eaton, thank you. Talking about a terrible tragedy. Okay. It is now just 24 minutes after the hour. Fourteen right now. According to news reports, a team of American and French scientists have found the Titanic, which of course is the great luxury uh, ocean liner that sank 73 years ago. The reports indicate it was spotted a few hundred miles off of Newfoundland and about two and a half miles down. Uh, the Titanic was designed, meant to be unsinkable, and they publicized that this was the unsinkable ship. And from the moment it sailed, the public has been fascinated by this ship. Well, when it sank in April of 1912, more than 1,500 lives were lost. In a moment, we're going to talk with a historian and author, Walter Lord, about the sinking of the ship. And we're going to talk live from London with a woman who survived uh, the uh, disaster at the time. Three years ago, on the 70th anniversary of the Titanic's uh, tragic maiden voyage, Joan spoke with three of the survivors, and we're going to hear some of what they have to say now, beginning with the story of a survivor, Frank Axe. He was just 10 months old when the ship sank. According to all reports and my mother's conversation with me over the many years, uh, mother was 18 years old with a 10-month baby, sailing on the Titanic. Originally, she was to come here on the Olympic. At the last moment, her parents decided they would pay the difference for her to come over on the Titanic because it was non-sinkable. That fateful night, mother felt the crash because she was coming up steerage to this country. And as she made her way to the rail of the second class, and while there, when the rumors flying that the Titanic would sink. She tried to go back down because she had been asleep. It was 20 minutes to 12 o'clock, 11.40. She couldn't get back down for people coming up from steerage would carry the bulk of the passenger list. And uh, this chap went berserk, and he snatched me out of my mother's arms and proceeded to throw me oh, over boy. the side of the ship. Not knowing that I was alive, my mother was in a state of shock. I landed in the lap of a Mrs. Nye, who later became Mrs. Darby. But it wasn't until days later that she It was three days later, I boarded the Carpathia, that entering New York Harbor, that Mother knew that I was alive, because Mrs. Nye was walking around with me in her arms, and I reached out for my mother. She had been nursing me. My mother was still awake, and she was sitting at the edge of the bed. And uh, when, when the, um, the boats, she felt the boats strike real hard, strike the iceberg, and it jarred and shook. And at that time, I woke up and I asked her what was going on. She said, uh, we don't know, I don't know exactly, but I felt the boat strike something real hard and, uh, and it strike again and it struck, it struck again and it stopped. We were assigned to a lifeboat and uh, the man stood there 
uh, the men were crowding, and they said, stand back, stand back, the English. Well, I don't want to be saved as men. I, we had a baby, but who'll save this baby? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I'll save the baby. And the mother had gone ahead in another boat. As the boat was going down, our uh, master at arms, his name was Bailey, so got us all to sing. Pull for the shore, sailors, pull for the shore. So we would not, to counteract the screaming of those who were touching the water, you know, because that scream of death is worse than any siren. Edwina McKenzie, by the way, made many more trips across the Atlantic, both by ship and by plane. She died last December at the age of 100. Walter Lord is the author of the well-known book about the Titanic, A Night to Remember. Uh, he's also a member of the Titanic Historical Society. He's joining me this morning here in New York to give us his views about the reports of the finding of the Titanic. And Eva Hart is joining us from London this morning, live by satellite, and she is a survivor. Miss Hart, it's nice to have you with us this morning from London. Thank you. M Mr. Lord, how convinced are you they've found the, the Titanic? I think after many years of false alarms, this time they really have, judging from the reports that I've seen. Right. What, what would you wait to hear? What are the questions you have to, a, to, to convince you that they have found the ship? And what will be the tip-offs that maybe somebody's trying to pull the wool over? Something that you can identify, but I understand that they uh, definitely have good pictures of, of uh, at least one boiler, and I would think that would be pretty conclusive. Right. Uh, also, I think I'd be interested in knowing what her position was. Right, exactly her position. Yes, not just 370 miles off Newfoundland, but uh, her longitude and latitude. Miss Hart, if you can, tell us your memories of that night when you were hit, or you hit the memories. iceberg. Memories of that night. Well, that started, of course, by my being wakened by my mother. Because naturally, at seven years of age, I was in bed in the seat. Mm -hmm. But before that night, there had been a great deal of unhappiness because my mother had this terrible premonition about the ship and didn't want to sail in her. Why? And my... F well, she said that to say that a ship was unsinkable, was flying in the face of God. And she was very firm about that. And it is only because she had that premonition and refused to go to bed in that ship. Never went to bed in that ship. She used to sit up all night and go to sleep all day and so we were on deck very quickly after the impact and as you know it, it was the small number of lifeboats which caused so many people to die that night so it was a case of the first people on deck being how, able to get in a boat how did how did you and your mother manage to get off the ship my father put us in a lifeboat and stood back himself and made no attempt to get in at all None at all. But as I say, we were there very quickly. What? There long before they lowered the boats, of course. If, if they indeed have found the Titanic down in the bottom of the ocean, what, what are your personal feelings about what they should or shouldn't do with it or to it? Well, my personal feeling as a woman is just that they should leave it there because I look upon it as my father's grave. And over the years, ever since people first talked about the possibility of raising her, I've always said, I thought not. But if it's going to be very great um, scientific discovery and will do a lot of good by finding ways and means, well then, of course, I have nothing to say about that. They will do it. Mr. Lord, what about that? Uh, any any scientific reasons really to go down there? We've we've made so many advances since then, and oh, but, uh, to go down? I think there are great reasons to to do that. Uh, I understand. Let me first of all say I understand perfectly what Eva how Eva feels, and I don't want to see people rummaging around down there either any more than she does. Mm -hmm. But I think being able to locate it is a very important thing. It's important because uh, first of all that same technique and that same machinery, the same equipment can be used to find all kinds of things under the sea. The United States Navy lost a submarine called the Thresher some years ago, atomic submarine, and it, it's, uh, they've never been able really to get to the bottom of exactly what happened, but if with equipment like they are developing now, perhaps they will in the future. Mm -hmm. So it will save that kind of situation. Then for prospecting for minerals, I think that this could be a very valuable thing. In other equipment. words, this, uh, again, the same equipment to, to learn what it's capable of doing. Yeah. Uh, for and to learn what's at the bottom of the sea. People don't realize that 
we only know half of, of the of bottom of the ocean floor with the equipment we've had until now. And perhaps this will enable us to know the other half, and the deeper half, and the more mysterious half. Walter Lord, great to have you back with us. Thank you very much. And Eva Hart in London, it's nice to have you with us. Nice to meet you long distance here this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In our next uh, half hour this morning, we'll be talking about rodeoing and with two of the great horseback uh, riders and one bull rider and also Debbie Allen, who doesn't ride any of those things. She dances and choreographs and acts and she'll be with us as well. We'll be right back. the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. President Reagan took time on this, his first day back at the White House, to have his aides fire statements back at Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Bill Plant reports. The Washington-Moscow pre-summit public relations battle shifted into high gear today as Soviet leader Gorbachev told visiting U.S. senators he's ready to make radical new offers to reduce Soviet weapons. And the White House spokesman challenged the Kremlin to put President Reagan on Soviet television. After hearing Gorbachev say that he will not oppose basic research on space weapons, members of the Senate delegation were encouraged. I'm somewhat optimistic, more so than I was, when I came here with respect to the possible outcome at the summit. White House spokesman Larry Speaks fired back at the Soviets, challenging them to put their arms control proposals on the table at Geneva. Responding to Gorbachev's charge in a recent interview that the U.S. is engineering a confrontation at the summit, Speaks said President Reagan is willing to meet the Soviets halfway. Our views of the causes of present U.S.-Soviet tensions are quite different from that presented by Mr. Gorbachev, but we do not intend to enter into a debate in the media. Noting that the Soviets have been appearing frequently on U.S. television, Speaks asked for equal time. Direct access for President Reagan to the Soviet people would go far in improving understanding between our people. And what are the chances of that? So far, the Soviets aren't saying. I don't know. Maybe there will be a Soviet publication which will ask Reagan. Maybe not. I don't know. What the White House knows for sure is that the new Kremlin leader is challenging the great communicator in a public relations war on his own turf. By the time we get to Geneva, said one official, this summit may rise or fall on spontaneity, on one good symbolic gesture. Bill Plant, CBS News, the White House. Vietnamese officials in Hanoi and Reagan administration officials in Washington continue expressing increasing optimism about determining the facts on Americans still missing from the Vietnam War. But Pentagon correspondent David Martin tonight reports that some families are having increasing doubts about previous stories saying their loved ones already have been accounted for. Catherine Fanning waited 17 years for her husband to come home. 17 years from the day Marine pilot Hugh Fanning was reported missing in action over North Vietnam to the day his remains came home for burial. Afterwards, she described the sense of peace at finally being able to say goodbye. But she had to be sure and decided to exhume the remains. Now that peace has turned to suspicion. Now that I cannot determine that these bones are Hugh Fanning, naturally the possibility exists that he is alive. Mrs. Fanning's doubts are based on the opinion of a respected forensic anthropologist who released his findings today. The available osteological evidence is not sufficient to positively identify the remains as those of Major Hugh Fanning. The initial identification was made by the Army's Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii, and Pentagon officials insist there was no mistake. We feel that it is the best possible identification forensically possible and we remain fully confident in the findings of the laboratory but mrs fanning is not the only mia relative to doubt the lab's identification experts told don parker there is no way of knowing for sure whether the bones recovered from this crash site in laos were those of his missing uncle it's unnecessarily trying to close the case and uh, in the case of this group of men I think it was a political motivation to renew aid to uh, Laos. 26 more remains recently turned over by the Vietnamese are now being examined at the Army lab in Hawaii. But as long as there are doubts about the Army's identification of those remains, there will be no end to the suffering for relatives of the missing. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. Those scientists we told you about last night who found the sunken Titanic, today said they're amazed at what good shape the ship is in. But the joint U.S.-French expedition has no intention 
of trying to bring the Titanic to the surface, nor of trying to recover valuables. The Titanic went down in 1912 with 1,500 people still aboard. Using new, exclusive underwater footage, Terry Drinkwater tonight gives us a first look at the graveyard legend that now is the Titanic. Expedition leaders aboard the research vessel, the USS Nord, discovered today that the Titanic is substantially intact. Robot TV pictures and sonar soundings set up from two and a half miles beneath the sea confirm that the ship is at rest and upright, and that she lies in a deep ocean canyon. Experts theorize today that when she hit bottom 73 years ago, her upper decks and probably two of her smokestacks withstood the impact but that her hull was ripped open by several of her 29 boilers, which were thrust out and forward by the impact. These first pictures from the remote-controlled TV cameras reveal one of her huge boilers, the shape quite recognizable. And closer up, the distinctive stoking doors on the boilers, which were fired to make her among the fastest ships on Earth. The doors, the first absolute confirmation that this is the Titanic. Here, giant rivets dating construction to the first decade of this century. Close-up TV cameras have been lowered overboard for detailed colored images expected to be available tomorrow. Radio reports from the ship say they have already seen portholes and the corroded bulkhead of the officers' quarters. It's like going back in time, in a sense, uh, the uh, fact that the ship is in total darkness uh, adds to that uh, feeling of uh, eeriness. Uh, it's a uh, nice feeling, though. Yet the mood tonight of the crew aboard the research ship was not one of elation at the discovery. They all had a sadness that at last they had come face to face with this story and the tragedy that this story involves. It is as if, said one crew member, we are intruders. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, St. John's, Newfoundland. After a week-long voyage of nearly three million miles, the Space Shuttle Discovery came home today. The shuttle and its five-man crew made a perfect landing just before dawn on the dry lake runway at Edwards Air Force Base in California. This was the last flight for Discovery until next March, when it is scheduled to take off from a new launch pad at California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. found the Titanic. The sinking of that luxury liner has been the subject of plays and books and songs and movies for more than seven decades, but now that they've found her, the question is what to do with her. We have this report from our station in Boston. The wreckage of the ship they said was unsinkable has been found in the darkness beneath 13,000 feet of water, 370 miles off Newfoundland, 73 years after it went down in a tragedy which took more than 1,500 lives. The crew of this research vessel, the NOR, out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, found the wreckage. They lowered a photo submarine called the Argo to the bottom. They say they have unbelievable pictures. This morning, for the first time, the Woods Hole base station confirmed the underwater cameras of the NOR have taken those photos in a ship-to-shore conversation with the leader of the expedition. first thing that we encountered were the uh, boilers that had gone through the bow. The uh, first image we had was a boiler over. We have absolutely no desire uh, to raise the Titanic. That would be uh, ridiculous. Uh, the ship is in beautiful condition where it is. Uh, it's sitting upright, and it looks gorgeous, and I think it ought to be left where it is. For those who survived the tragedy, mixed feelings about the discovery of the wreckage, since friends and loved ones are buried with the Titanic. They should leave it there, because I look upon it as my father's grave. And over the years, ever since people first talked about the possibility of raising her, I've always said, I thought not. Finding the Titanic in the pitch darkness two and a half miles down on the bottom of the North Atlantic marks a new beginning in the science of underwater research. The first photos and videotape of the fallen giant will soon be made public. The instant heroes, the crew of the NOR, are due back at Woods Hole on Monday. Jack Harper, News Center 5. It's also uh, kind of a fuss over who might own what is left of the Titanic. Some say it's whoever salvages the valuables from it, but a Texas oil millionaire who financed two searches for the trip said the Rights belong to him. Jack Grimm said he staked his claim when he found a propeller that he said was from the ship back in 1981, and he said that yesterday's discovery just supports his original claim. Oh, Adam. 
It's the stuff of fiction and of Hollywood. Finding the most famous shipwreck of the 20th century, the liner Titanic, on the ocean floor. Now, it's no longer a fantasy, it's happened. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. Now that they've found it, what do they do with it? What are the arguments for and against raising the Titanic? And why has this disaster in particular held such a grip on our imaginations for so many years? This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. This camera that they're using to find and photograph the Titanic is an astonishing piece of equipment. Just to give you a sense of it, when most of us take photographs, we normally use film with an ASA of about 100. The higher that ASA number, the faster the film. That is, the less light it requires. The light sensitivity of that camera taking pictures more than two miles beneath the surface of the North Atlantic is about 200,000 ASA. Something else to stagger the imagination. Back in 1912, the Commercial Union Insurance Company paid out $1,380,000 in claims after the Titanic sunk. The same company is still around, and it's ready to pay a salvage fee, if salvaging is possible. But as Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield reports, our interest in the Titanic goes far beyond cameras and salvage projects. It is the most famous shipwreck in history, the stuff of which legends are made. Even the fantasy that the Titanic might someday be discovered, even brought to the surface of the North Atlantic, was enough to inspire a best-selling book and a film. But why does this one disaster haunt us so? Why did the news that the wreck of the Titanic had in fact been located more than 73 years after it left Southampton, England, on its doomed maiden voyage, trigger front-page headlines around the world. There have been far worse catastrophes in our time, but few, if any, so fascinate us. The reasons for our fascination go beyond the scope of the disaster. When the Titanic went down off the coast of Newfoundland on its way to New York Harbor, it took with it more than 1,500 lives. It took, as well, a whole set of beliefs, articles of faith, that had come to dominate our thinking in the first part of this century. The Titanic was a triumph of modern technology. The ship God himself couldn't sink. It embodied faith in the new God of science, a faith that Columbia history professor Henry Graff says was severely tested by the sinking. The Western world was very proud of the lights of science and how science was going to solve the problems of the world. And here we have this terrible Pearl Harbor of technology. In a way, it's the first uh, of the great blows to the uh, blind faith that science can do everything. The ship also symbolized the power of a great empire. Britain in 1912, under the newly crowned George V, ruled a quarter of the Earth's land surface and a quarter of its people. The sun, in fact, never did set on the British Empire in those days, an empire built on dominance of the world's oceans. What did the disaster say to that empire? What it does say is, even an empire that can have so much wealth and draw so much uh, in the way of the world's goods uh, to itself, even these people must vie with uncertainty. It is a summing up of British greatness, and um, it, it winds up uh, uh, unable to beat the forces of nature. And perhaps more than anything, the Titanic symbolized wealth, the aristocracy of money, at a time when the wealthy were the only genuine celebrities. John Jacob Astor and Benjamin Guggenheim were among the wealthy who sailed on that maiden voyage. Both perished. These were people of wealth uh, who had vied for a place on the Titanic, had paid enormous sums of money for the choice of staterooms. And uh, the thought that these people had uh, uh, struggled, uh, competed to get reservations on this ship and we're now at the bottom of the sea undoubtedly added to the uh, drama and the interest it says there are limits to greatness uh, of an earthly kind and that is the message I think that millions of people all over the world received and continue to receive from this great disaster 
We may someday see the remains of the great ship Titanic brought back to the surface of the ocean. We may someday look upon a fortune in jewels that are supposedly still on board. But the articles of faith, faith in wealth, in imperial power, in technology, that the Titanic symbolized, those are gone forever. This is Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in New York. When we return, we'll talk with Dr. Bob Spindle of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where they developed some of the special underwater equipment that found the Titanic. And with Clive Cussler, author of the novel, Raise the Titanic, who as an undersea explorer has uncovered over 50 shipwrecks himself. Well, as an individual, when I'm asked, would you like to see the Titanic raised? My answer is a firm no. You say, why? I say, because to me, it's my father's grave. And I, I don't want, I don't ever want to see the Titanic again. I don't, I don't want to see it raised. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by BMW. What's the problem? My car doesn't work either. We'll take it for a test drive. Really? Vroom, vroom. Sounds like the transmission. Same problem as your dad's. Can you fix it? Sure, we're experts. We can fix any car. Foreign, too. At Amco, we care as much about people as we do transmissions. It's what we call double-A service, and it's why we fix more transmissions than anyone else. It's this. You get double-A service at double-A MCO. I read it every day for news around the USA. I read it every day for business that really pays. I read it every day for weather that's on the way. I read it every day for sports that people play. Every day for movies, books, and plays. At home or away, I read it every day. USA Today, every day. A fundamentalist Anonymous, helping some Christian fundamentalists leave the fold without the feelings of guilt and fear tomorrow on ABC's World News Tonight. With us now live in our Boston Bureau is Dr. Bob Spindell, head of the Ocean Engineering Department at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on Cape Cod, where the undersea electronic eyes that helped find the Titanic were developed. And in our Washington Bureau, author and undersea explorer, Clive Cussler. Mr. Cussler, it's getting more and more difficult for your imagination to stay ahead of reality, isn't it? Did you ever believe when you were writing Raise the Titanic that it might come to this? Oh, I'd certainly hope so. I, I, I certainly dreamed that, that someday it would at least be found and, and nobody could be happier that at last they're laying a camera on the Titanic. All right, now put aside for a moment your credentials as a, as a fine author of fiction and give us your credentials as an undersea expert. The chances of ever bringing the Titanic up. You made it happen in your book. You believe it can really happen? Uh, I, I think in reality, Ted, it'd be uh, uh, very impractical. Uh, we don't really have the technology. Uh, if we couldn't bring up the uh, Lusitania and the uh, Andrea Doria from 240 feet, I don't think we're going to bring up the Titanic from, uh, say, 13,000. Uh, if we put a man on the moon, uh, theoretically, we could raise the Titanic, but uh, the cost would probably be in the neighborhood of between three and four billion dollars. So I, I don't know of anybody who's going to underwrite the project. Why so high? What is it that's so enormously difficult about it? Well, bringing up, you're, you're talking about uh, how many, 49 some odd thousand gross tons of, of iron steel from that's sunk in the mud, uh, the suction at this enormous depth. Uh, we really don't have the technology. The closest we've come would be the Glomar Explorer pulling up uh, bits of the uh, Russian submarine in the Pacific. But it, it just would be an enormous project. Actually, it would be uh, comparable as far as the, the effort to putting uh, men on the moon. Well, now, in your book, uh, you, you spoke of somehow sealing the great gashes in the side of the ship and pumping it full of air and letting the air pull it up. That wouldn't work? Well, uh, that was the most practical we could come up with. I talked to a lot of salvage men, and that's, that's what we kind of devised in this particular case. But there again, it's, it's technology that nobody's ever built yet. All right, Dr. Spindell, yeah. tell us a little bit about this camera, would you? It, it seems to be an extraordinary piece of equipment. Well, it is an extraordinary piece of equipment. It's a, it's a brand new development. It's, it's arisen out of an evolution of previous underwater equipment. Um, it allows um, scientists for the first time to take much wider area views of the ocean bottom and much more detailed views of the ocean bottom than they've ever been able to 
do before. This, of course, you know, was the first test of the camera, and it really is quite a successful test, as finding the Titanic attests. All right, explain to those of us who are lay people, as far as photography of any kind is concerned, what is so extraordinary about taking pictures two miles down? I think the very difficult part, of course, is to put a camera within a pressure housing that allow it to withstand the enormous pressures at 13,000 foot depth. And of course, it's dark down there, and one has to illuminate um, the bottom, or the, um, in this case, the Titanic, with extremely um, bright lights. The 200,000 ASA speed that you refer to, in some senses, refers not only to the film, but to the brightness of the actual lights that are used to illuminate the bottom. Now, have you spoken to your colleagues over there who are in the process of, of, of literally looking at the Titanic right yes. now? Yes, yeah, we've been in communication uh, with the ship early this morning. All right, tell me, tell me what they're finding. What are they seeing? Well, they say they see the Titanic. Uh, they say there's no doubt that they have um, found it. It appears to be upright in the water and intact and in very good condition. What else are they seeing? What, uh, someone mentioned to me that uh, they'd actually spotted pieces of luggage lying somewhere next to the, next I, to the Well, I haven't heard that. Um, I assume there must be luggage scattered around. I've, I heard uh, from them that they have spotted boilers, uh, which, are, which belong to the Titanic, and they have then taken enough other video um, pictures and photographic images to determine for certain that it is the Titanic that they're looking at. What is the purpose now of, I mean, what, from, from this point on? I mean, is your project complete? Have you done what you wanted to do? Yes, yeah, so this was a basic test of instrumentation that was developed actually under United States Navy funding for the scientific community. And this test of it um, indicates that it works. It is now a piece of equipment that will be used by scientists on other expeditions. They will continue um, to photograph the Titanic while they're on the site until they must leave um, later in the week and come back to Woods Hole. Um, I suspect that um, we will probably try, or others will probably try, to get a closer look or a better look at it with other camera systems or perhaps with submarine systems sometime in the future. Mr. Kessler, where does it go from here? It's been found. It will have been photographed. We will all have seen pictures, pre uh, presumably even some film or videotape of, of, the, of the ship. Is that going to be it? No, I think as Dr. Spindell suggests, that uh, the next step will be to send out probably submersibles with, uh, old, say, the mechanical arms and to bring up uh, some of the relics, some of the artifacts. Uh, this would be the most interesting thing. This is really the value of the, the Titanic. It's not, there was no treasure on board to speak of, but uh, I know myself, uh, I'd, I'd beg, borrow, and steal ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars if I could buy a dish that came up out of the dining salon. It just that'd be that'd be a marvelous artifact to own. Why? I think it would. Yeah, why? I mean, e e explain that one to me. If it was something five hundred years old, six hundred years old, I can understand that. What is it about the? Let let your creativity come to bear here a little bit. Uh, what is it about the Titanic? that is so extraordinary. I think we, we, we just have to take one of the aspects that uh, occurred during the sinking and that was the fact that it took about two hours and 40 minutes to sink. You compare it to the Lusitania which went down in 18 minutes and, and very little is recorded. In fact Vanderbilt went down on the Lusitania and that's uh, quite forgotten but the Titanic with this time that it took to sink there were all these uh, little acts of drama that were recorded uh, uh, Benjamin Guggenheim and his butler putting on their finest evening clothes so they could go down like gentlemen. We know about Molly Brown and the lifeboat. We, uh, uh, we know about the band playing right up until the last minute. Um, there's so many of these little acts of drama that, that were recorded with the Titanic that just gave it this marvelous aura and this, this mystique. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about precisely that kind of thing because when we come back, we'll be joined by Ken Marshall, an expert on the history of the Titanic. Joining us live now in our Los Angeles Bureau is Ken Marshall, a member of the Titanic Historical Society. Mr. Marshall, we have paid at least a nod of tribute to the scientific achievement of finding this great ship, but I suspect that many people are listening because they want to hear some more of those stories. The kind of thing that we just heard, this, this great rich man, Mr. Guggenheim, and his butler getting dressed so that they go down like gentlemen. Tell us a couple of stories, will you? Well... I think the reason the Titanic uh, captivates us so much is that, for once, history was truth was actually stranger and more captivating than, than history. You, you build the largest and the most luxurious ocean liner that has ever been built up to that time. You uh, 
fill it with the most wealthy and influential people of two continents, and you sail it across a glassy, smooth Atlantic Ocean, and on a mirror-flat North Atlantic Sea, on a starlit night with no moon, you crash into a, a rare kind of iceberg, a blackberg, they believe it was, and down she goes in two hours and 40 minutes, not to mention that the, fact, the, the fact that the ship is supposed to be unsinkable. It's such an unbelievable drama that uh, if you were to write a screenplay like this, for example, with all of the drama and all of these amazing coincidences within it, and you gave it to a producer, he would probably say, nah, nobody'd ever buy it. It's just, it's too fantastic. And here it actually happened, it's true. Any great stories of heroism associated with the sinking of the Titanic? Well, yes, uh, particularly toward the end with the, the, um, the people trying to escape the ship and helping other people into the lifeboats, uh, the, the officers standing back and the, the, the chivalry that took place and the fact that really considering the circumstances and the fact that toward the end they did realize that the ship was going to go down, there was remarkable, remarkably little um, trouble keeping the people back, keeping the men back. The very few people tried to rush the boats. Why were there not sufficient lifeboats for all the passengers and crew? Well, in 1912, the British Board of Trade Regulations uh, stated that any vessel over 10,000 gross tons only had to have 16 wooden boats. And these regulations were horribly outdated at the time shipping. These went back to the late 1800s and in 1912, they still had not changed the regulations. So we had these horribly outdated regulations. Here we built a ship that was 46,328 gross tons and put only the standard 16 wooden lifeboats on board. And this would only hold about a third uh, of those who, were, who ended up taking the voyage. You have spent a good part and, of uh, your... Because of that, yeah. of course, so many lives were lost. Actually, the White Star Line went beyond the call of duty and provided four extra Engelhart collapsible boats. So uh, there were actually 20 boats in all. There's another interesting aspect to the uh, safety features aboard the Titanic, and that is the, the loss of the Titanic um, spurred the development of sonars in order to find icebergs to prevent a similar accident, and it was a French sonar, which was part of this expedition, which helped locate the Titanic, so to sort of come full circle from disaster to finding itself. Mr. Yeah. Kessler, you, you were speaking a moment ago of a story of great heroism. You spoke of Molly Brown. I assume she is the one that we have come to know as the unsinkable Molly Brown, but tell us the rest of that story, would you? Well, Mrs. J.J. Brown, of course, uh, uh, she was quite a society matron, and she was returning from Europe uh, back to Denver. And uh, when the ship went down, she didn't want to get in the lifeboat, which was not uncommon. Most of the women didn't feel uh, this big, great floating city was actually going to sink into the black water. And they didn't want to get in this small little boat that was suspended over about uh, 60, 80 feet uh, above, you know, the, this icy uh, sea. So she didn't want to get in, and she was finally more or less um, pushed in by some of the gentlemen there. But uh, when she got down into the water, the, uh, the fellow, the British crewman that was uh, put at the tiller of the lifeboat, uh, well, he, he was kind of a flaky sort, I suppose, because uh, when the ship sank, she wanted to uh, go back and rescue some of the people who were are floating in the water. And he refused to do it for fear that so many of them would climb over the, uh, the gunnels that the, their lifeboat would sink. So they got in quite an argument. Um, she didn't have a pistol and wave it around, as Myth says, but she did organize the women to, uh, to row and keep warm. So she, she was quite a character in her own right. One thing to mention, too, Ted, is the fact that um, people didn't really, too many of them drowned on the Titanic. They died of exposure. The water was 28 degrees, so most of them, when they did go in, uh, didn't last more than probably four or five minutes. Well, actually, I was about to ask you, and, and either you or Mr. Marshall uh, pick up on it, those who got into the lifeboats, first of all, how did, how did people know that they were out there? I assume that there had been time to, to radio an SOS, but how long did it take, and, and who came to their rescue? Can you go ahead? <laughs> well, all right. Uh, the, the Carpathia was the one that ended up coming to the rescue of the Titanic. She was 58 miles to the southeast, and uh, she was the one. That it, she arrived at 4 in the morning, picked up the first boat, and, uh, in fact, picked up all of the boats. The Californian steamed up at around 8 a.m. and asked if she could render any assistance and take any of the the boats or transfer any of the passengers uh, onto her, but uh, Captain Rostron of the, of the Carpathia said no. The 
survivors' events are enough, I'm taking them all with me to New York. Now, Mr. Marshall, you've spent a good deal of your life studying this ship and what happened aboard her. If, if it were possible now to find one artifact from that ship, or if it were possible to answer one question that for you has remained unanswered all these years, what would that be? Mr. Marshall, have we lost contact? I gather from your blank expression I'll that we have. You. So let me, let me put the question to you, Mr. Kessler. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Uh, the controversy between the California and the Titanic will now be solved. This is the uh, famous situation where the California, the freighter, had stopped uh, in the middle of the ice pack waiting until morning before it continued. In other words, Captain Lord of the California was a little smarter than Captain Smith of the Titanic. Uh, supposedly, crewmen saw distress flares off in the distance of the ship that was, uh, they didn't know whether it was sinking or distress or what, and the California did not respond. The big controversy was, was the California even close enough to respond? Captain Lord said that he was at least, I guess, about 15 or 11 miles off, so therefore he would have never made it in time anyway, but a lot of people think that he was only a few miles away. Uh, his was a fixed position, and the Titanic sinking was a dead reckoning position. Now that they know exactly where the Titanic went down, they can measure the distance between this spot and the California and clear up that controversy once and for all, whether the California could have saved the Titanic passengers. All right. When we come back, I'm going to ask each of you one quick question, one quick answer. If we could raise the Titanic, would you? We'll continue. And I'm Kathleen Sullivan. For what you need to know as you begin your day. Wake up to ABC's World News this morning before Good Morning America. I'm David Hartman. Tomorrow in Good Morning America, we'll meet a man who infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. Also, we'll talk with Hill Street News Betty Thomas about her new movie on Good Morning America. Back once again with our guests. And gentlemen, a quick question and please a quick answer from each of you. If you could, Mr. Marshall, would you raise her? Uh, Ted, it all depends on the, the circumstances. If it were to be raised for commercial, uh, exploitative reasons of any sort, absolutely not. Uh, if it were to be raised with a conscientious effort, fully funded by a responsible organization, and they would respect it as the historical monument that it is, uh, I would consider it. Yes. All right. Dr. Spindell. No, and the chief scientist aboard the vessel speaking for the institution and for the French who were part of the expedition and the U.S. Navy, who funded it, feel that it should remain as a memorial to those who perished aboard the Titanic. And finally, Mr. Kessler. Quick answer, hell yes. Hell yes. Okay, <laughs> well, that's, that, that's as good an answer as I expect to get. Gentlemen, I thank you for a fascinating evening, and uh, I thank each of you for the contribution you've made to, uh, toward keeping interest alive in the, in the great ship Titanic. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow night, a special edition of Nightline. The Reverend Jesse Jackson and the Reverend Jerry Falwell join us live for a face-to-face -face debate. The topic, South Africa. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. These the best pictures so far of the sunken ship. We'll have an update. The Night Stalker suspect has been formally charged with murder. We'll talk with the DA. And a Prairie Home Companions Garrison Keeler drops in. Hello, love. Well, we're in the world. All of that ahead on the CBS Morning News. And a very good morning to you, smack in the middle of the week. I'm Forrest Sawyer. Yes, Tuesday morning, and I'm Maria Shriver. Excuse me, Wednesday morning. It's September 4th. And there are some intriguing pictures this morning from what appears to be the wreckage of the Titanic. The ship's massive cast iron boiler show up on these photos taken two and a half miles under the water. There you see them. First evidence that a team really has found the Titanic. And we'll talk live with the expedition's leader in just a few minutes. That should be wonderful. It should. Also today, you've had a little bit of a break, I know, but now Washington is going back to work in 1912 until this week no human being had seen the luxury liner titanic but the crew of the research ship nor has its eyes on the sunken wreckage now and plans to send back more pictures today here's what we've seen so far 
images taken by a remote control submarine. They showed the ship's cast iron boilers about 13,000 feet underwater. The first time anyone's seen any sign of the Titanic since she went down. More pictures are due out today. You'll see them tonight on the CBS Evening News. But right now, we've got the leader of the Titanic mission, Dr. Robert Ballard, live on ship to shore telephone. He was the first to see the Titanic's wreckage. Let's talk with him now. Good morning, Dr. Ballard. Roger, this is a Woodfall Research Vessel, Nora. How do you copy? Over. I copy you well. Let me ask you, can you bring us up to date on what must be an extraordinary sight? Exactly what have you seen so far? Uh, well, at the present moment, the uh, vehicle has just uh, passed over the bridge of the ship. Uh, the ship uh, is in uh, uh, a very state of, uh, of uh, condition. Some parts of the ship are remarkably in great shape. Uh, about 10 minutes ago, we saw beautiful color pictures of cases and cases of uh, wine uh, bottles, uh, totally undamaged uh, plates, uh, all sorts of other material that did not break up, whereas other parts of the ship are damaged. Over. Well, as you say, you have seen cases and cases of wine. There are supposedly lots of other valuables, jewelry on the ship. Do you plan to try and discover that? Uh, no, that's uh, not the goal of the expedition. It's really to uh, image the vessel. It's, uh, there's no plans uh, at all to uh, touch the vessel or to attempt to recover anything on it. Why is that, Dr. Ballard? Is it that you do not want to remove the ship from under the water, or is it just too expensive to do so? Uh, I believe the ship is a uh, memorial to 1,500 people that died, and I have uh, no desire to desecrate it over. How can you be sure, then, if you leave the ship where it is, that other people will not come and try and salvage it, will try and search for the valuables to leave to be on board? I, I really can't say uh, what others are going to do. I hope that uh, the U.S. government and the French government, who uh, sponsored uh, both phases of this uh, expedition, can uh, work out a way to uh, ensure that the uh, Titanic is made into an international memorial and uh, left alone over it. Dr. Ballard, you, you've discovered the boilers Sunday morning. You've discovered the other things 10 minutes ago, as you mentioned. How do you proceed from here? What's next? Well, we've uh, pretty well identified the first forward half of the ship, uh, from the second funnel forward uh, across the bridge to the bow. Uh, the bow is, uh, upper part of the bow is in uh, remarkably good condition, considering the fact that it's the part that uh, felt the iceberg and the part that uh, collided with the bottom. The, the under part of the bow is badly damaged where the boilers came out. But the actual top, the very small little uh, flagpole right on the very tip of the Titanic bow is still standing there uh, totally uh, pristine. Over. How many more days do you plan to continue the expedition? Uh, we should be finished with uh, the testing that we want to do with our vehicles in the next day or so and hope to be heading home on soon, over. And then will this continue periodically? Will you be returning to the site every couple of months? No, uh, definitely not. Uh, the weather window in this area is rather severe. Uh, we've experienced extremely uh, heavy seas and heavy winds uh, the other night. Uh, so this is not uh, the nicest place in the world to, go, to come. Uh, one can only come during the summer weather window. Uh, and what we do in the future is really going to be determined by, uh, by the Navy. Over. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Dr. Ballard, and best of luck to you. As we mentioned earlier, you will see more pictures of this tonight on the CBS Evening News. It is now 15... Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. CBS News has received more new exclusive photographs, by far the best jet of the Titanic. For most of this century, that huge passenger liner has been a dead ship, resting in an ocean grave that until the past few days, no one had seen. Now, scientists have even seen the iceberg damage that doomed the Titanic. Terry Drinkwater begins our coverage with the new underwater photographs. Until this photograph, for 73 years, what happened when the Titanic hit bottom had been a mystery. Here, her bow, as it looks today. The railing around it, along which millionaires strolled on its maiden voyage, is still intact. But below, there is a giant bulge where the double steel hull, considered impregnable by its designers, buckled and broke when the ship plunged into the total darkness of a deep ocean canyon. Well, 
his research ship two and a half miles above the liner, the expedition's director, Robert Ballard, described the images historians have waited nearly three quarters of a century to see. The bow sort of took all the beating, but all the damage that was done to the bow was in the under part of the bow, but the iceberg hit it. The length that we're looking at is a good uh, 30 to 50 feet. The remote-controlled robot sub, with its cameras aboard, then moved from the side of the Titanic up to directly above the ship, and more pictures. Now you're looking straight down. You're seeing the very tip of the uh, Titanic's bow, and a little mass that's coming up towards you is the uh, mass where they put a little flag. The camera then pointed to the bridge towards the captain's window, where the fateful order to abandon ship was given. And the boilers, each the size of a two-car garage, by the side of the wreck. Ballard is now sure what happened when the Titanic hit bottom. No doubt about the boilers roared through the bow. When the ship went vertical and the boilers broke loose, took out everything in their way. Because men cannot dive and work long at such depths, the camera subs must be unmanned and piloting them through the wreck is chancy. Technicians on the surface aboard the research ship nearly lost a sub when it hit a rigging around one of the Titanic's four towering smokestacks. It was trying to locate the huge aft section of the liner. And as Ballard told us tonight, so far, this part of the mission has failed. Uh, we're still searching for the stern. Uh, we can't find it. It does appear to be disconnected. The search for the rest of the Titanic can continue only until week's end, when the research ship leaves for home port, ahead of the North Atlantic winter storms. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, St. John's, Newfoundland. The Titanic, grand, powerful, confident, and soon to be two and a half miles under the sea. But it has floated in the world's imagination for 73 years. The Titanic was the first liner and the last liner anyone ever called unsinkable. I just could not believe that this magnificent ship, which was the most magnificent ship in this day, could actually sink completely. Everyone on board wasn't so sure. There were exceptions. You see, my mother refused to go to bed in that ship because she had this premonition, um, solely based on the fact that she said that to declare a vessel unsinkable was flying in the face of God. If the Titanic were around today, it would be doing package tours to the Caribbean. The world that went down that starry night featured a jet set that sailed the seas, gentlemen who dressed for dinner and offered women and children their places in the lifeboats. Imagine. There have been other disasters. The sinking of the Titanic was the granddaddy of them all. It was a preview of coming attractions. In a way, it was, um, it was a premonition of the First World War. It was a sign that an era was coming to an end, uh, and it uh, made people aware of the consequences of uh, excessive confidence. The Titanic taught a civilization that it's a dangerous world we live in, that there are icebergs lurking in the night. It brought many fears to the surface, but what about the Titanic itself? With 1,500 souls down there, I would agree we should be left where she is. Look at it, dream about it, but don't touch. The Titanic was the ship that sailed blithely off into the night and was never seen again until this week. On the expedition that found the tour into the hull of the Titanic uh, before it sank, and they showed, of course, that bow railing where many people uh, waited to die or to be saved. Dr. Robert Ballard of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is leading the Titanic expedition. Earlier this morning, I talked with him by ship to shore phone. I began by asking him which images of the ships the pictures of them had touched him the most deeply. I think uh, the images uh, on the promenade, up on the boat deck, uh, certainly around the bridge, uh, and particularly uh, the empty uh, lifeboat davits over. We understand that you believe that the, the, there are two halves of the ship, that the stern is disconnected. Uh, do you know where it is? What more can you tell us about it? Over. Uh, Roger, uh, it appears to be uh, uh, near the uh, other section, but offset uh, to one side, to the port side of the bow section. Over. Any idea why it uh, became disconnected? Over. Oh, I'm sure it had to do with the uh, 
tremendous collision it had with the bottom of the ocean that fell uh, over 13,000 feet over. Have you, uh, have you seen anything new since the last reports of the videotape and the, the reports that we have heard uh, since last night? Anything new today? Over. Well, what we've been doing all night uh, is uh, doing very uh, close-up color photography of the uh, bridge area and out onto the bow. And uh, this has been a very difficult night because, as I said, we're working at 13,000 feet of water, and we had to maneuver the camera sled to within 10 feet of the deck to get very high-quality pictures, which required us to maneuver up over the bridge, around the stack, and down onto the main deck. Over. What are your plans for today, and how long do you expect you're going to actually be there uh, taking pictures? Over. Uh, we're wrapping it up uh, right now. We're uh, call, uh, retrieving our camera sled that's been down all night. Uh, we will be processing the uh, color film. Uh, we took approximately 12,000 color pictures last night, and we'll be processing those pictures in our lab and uh, recovering our uh, acoustic transponders and heading home. Over. You have, you're quoted as saying that uh, it would be ridiculous to try to salvage the Titanic. How concerned are you that uh, private parties or uh, other countries might decide they want to try to salvage the ship? Over. Well, they'd have to salvage it in um, several pieces. It's not intact. Uh, I don't see the point of it. Uh, I can't believe that it has any commercial value, and it seems to be such a, uh, a bad thing to do. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great site. It's a, it's a memorial to 1,500 souls. Over. I understand that you, your crew had a memorial service. Can you tell us about that? Over. Uh, Roger, uh, ironically, uh, discovered the Titanic around 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, which was just 20 minutes uh, before it sank that evening. And uh, it, it did have an impact on us, and we had brought one of the flags and uh, had a private service on the stern and raised the flag for a few minutes. Over. Doctor, when did you first start thinking about this project? Over? Well, it's been a, an obsession for about 10 years. Over. How would you describe the effects on you personally of this whole experience over these years? Over. Well, I'm relieved that it's over. Uh, it's been something I've wanted to do all, all these last 10 years and have planned uh, very hard to... Uh, develop the technology and, and get in a, cape of, in a situation where I could do it. Although the primary purpose of the expedition was to uh, test our new camera systems, uh, I couldn't think of a better place to test them than at the Titanic site, and uh, we were very fortunate. Doctor, what do you do with that technology now that you've developed it? Well, I, I certainly think it's proved its point. It's, uh, to me, a new era in deep sea exploration. The uh, advanced electronic technology that is so much pervasive in your business has now entered the deep sea. Over. Dr. Ballard, uh, thank you for being with us from the NOR this morning, and we look forward to seeing you in person. Over. Roger, roger. This is the Whitfall Vessel NOR, KCJ, off and clear. Earlier this morning, and our next half hour, we'll talk to the man who says he is going to try to salvage the Titanic, or parts of it. And when we come back after these uh, commercial messages, Billie Jean King and Butch Waltz talk tennis and the U.S. Open. The discoverer of the wreck of the Titanic has made repeated appeals to leave the ship alone, but already several people have announced plans that they will try to salvage the ship. One of them is John Pierce, a British salvage expert who says he has an expedition set to go for the Titanic. He joins us from London, uh, and also Francis O'Brien is an expert in the law of the sea. He's vice president of the Maritime Law Association of the United States, and we welcome you both gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Pierce in London, uh, what plans do you have to try to salvage the Titanic? Well, very closely, we're watching the films that's coming in. We've had a vast amount of information already. Um, I'll say our 
the more we see, the more encouraged we are. I know that you uh, developed the technique to bring up the rainbow warrior from the bottom of the sea in New Zealand. What, how would you do this? I mean, how would you bring it up? Well, the designs for, for the bags were mine, which were used in the rainbow warrior. They're elongated teardrops. Uh, they've been used now for about the last four or five years. I developed that technique about four years ago. If I understand it correctly, this is where you put canvas bags and they're inflated and that brings it up with supposedly not damaging the actual hull, right? Uh, that's right. We can uh, lift a vessel. We can also stabilize it when it's in a state of wall and we can also tow it as well. But this one is two and a half miles down. You think that that's uh, feasible in this situation? Uh, yes, if the ship is intact and in one piece uh, and uh, it is reasonably feasible. Mr. Piz, Dr. Ballard has said on several occasions that it is, quote, ridiculous to try to raise the Titanic, and French oceanographer Jacques Cousteau says that there's really not enough value down there to justify bringing it up. What do you think you'll find? Uh, well, we're not interested in looking for vast valuables. It's an engineering challenge. Um, we are on standby to see if that engineering challenge is going to be put into a reality. And Dr. Ballard, of course, has not yet uh, told us the location of, of the ocean liner. Do you think that he will cooperate with you? Uh, it isn't required from our point of view. I think I know as much about the location of Titanic as Bob does. In fact, I spoke to Bob before he left. All right, here in New York, Mr. O'Brien, what is your reaction to this? And what uh, do you think there's enough of value to justify this? Well, uh, I think what I first should tell you about, there's a great misconception in the public mind as to salvage operations. Mm -hmm. It's not a game of finders keepers. Uh, Salvor uh, is not invested with title to the vessel. The owner still has title to the vessel. The, the, I can't better illustrate uh, that proposition than a, a, uh, the case that I was involved in a number of years ago. Uh, a Greek, small Greek uh, coastal ship was running between the United States and Bermuda. It came upon this huge tanker of flame. The crew of the tanker had fled the vessel, and the owners, rather the captain of this Greek vessel, boarded the other ship, put out the fire. At the conclusion of this effort, he ran up the Liberian flag, struck the Panamanian flag, and renamed the vessel in honor of the last lady who had shared his friendship on shore. Mm -hmm. He was under the decided misconception that he had titled to that vessel. Now, in the case of the Titanic, uh, according to the public press, uh, ownership is still vested in an insurance company in London who succeeded to a consortium which had insured the Titanic and paid the owners the proceeds after the tragedy. So what happens? Say, say that something is brought up. Where does it go? Who, who decides this? Uh, all of this would fall within, at least in the United States, within the jurisdiction of an admiralty court. The Salvor would be bound to bring the remains of the vessel if it is intact, as to a position uh, as near as he could in the United States, where it would go into the jurisdiction of a federal, federal admiralty court. And then the Salvor would come in and assert uh, his right to, to, to a percentage of the proceeds of the sale. Yes, I understand that anything you salvage, you have to take, you have to register with, and then they decide what kind of a percentage you get and what kind of a percentage what the original owner. Yes, yes. well, it, it's, you see, you must keep in mind that the ownership is still with the the actual owner. It All doesn't right. pass away. Which still exists? It doesn't still exist, does it? No, but the insurers in the case of the okay. Titanic have succeeded to the title of the vessel. Okay. What do you think, Mr. Pierce? How do you react to uh, everything you're hearing here? Uh, yes, and uh, interesting. I'll tell you what the situation is. Uh, you may recall I was in charge of the salvage operation of the Lusitania with your Pete Simmons, uh, and uh, that is three years ago. We have spent three years in the High Court in London uh, to establish how English law or in international law stands on a wreck in international waters. And that case is now settled in part out of court. Uh, we will be in a case-stated situation and uh, we are very familiar with the law on salvage, uh, having used the run for the Lusitania purely to find out exactly the legal situation with Titanic. And uh, I'm absolutely satisfied from that point of view of exactly how we stand in law. What do so, you think? Uh, I've plenty of experience. Well, I'm, I'm sure that what this gentleman says uh, may be correct insofar as English law is concerned. But I hope he's not suggesting for a moment that if he salved the vessel, that he would have title to it, because that is, would be 
clearly erroneous under American law. And that would be up to this uh, Admiralty Court, of course. Well, the Admiralty Court would, yeah. would say that the, the insurers, as successors to the owners, have title to it. Yeah. And then this, this gentleman, if he salves the vessel, he might be entitled to a very, very high award. It would depend on, on a, a series of imponderables, the risk that's involved, the labor, yeah. his ingenuity, his skill, the value of the south property. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on it. Thank you for joining us from London, Mr. Pierce. Yes, it's Good a luck. pleasure. I'm looking forward to talking to you further in the future. All right. We have bye -bye. a lot to give you. Thank you. And Mr. O'Brien, thank you. You're welcome. We will look at how to uh, how good a buy cancer insurance is right after this from Howard Johnson. CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Talking baseball. In another era, a young fan might have said, say it ain't so, Lonnie and Keith and Enos and Dave and John and Jeff. Those are the first names of Major League Baseball players expected to testify in a drug trafficking trial now underway. But say it ain't so these days may seem too much for even a young fan to hope. Harold Dow explains why. Lonnie Smith, outfielder for the Kansas City Royals, played today to a jury in federal court in a trial that's bound to implicate more than a dozen Major League Baseball players as cocaine users. Keith Hernandez, first baseman for the New York Mets, currently on deck, waiting for his turn to take the witness stand. U.S. Attorney Jim Ross outlined his case against Curtis Strong, a Philadelphia caterer accused of supplying cocaine to baseball players. You may hear something about Major League Baseball that may surprise you, even shock you, Ross told the jury of nine women and three men. But keep in mind, baseball is not on trial here. The defendant, Curtis Strong, is. Defense attorney Adam Renfro forcefully contradicted the government's case. Major League Baseball is on trial, he said. He called the players hero criminals, junkies who sold cocaine and who are still selling it to other players in the National League. Lonnie Smith told the court how he became addicted to cocaine. He said he started buying grams and eventually bought more, an eighth of an ounce at a time. He identified the defendant, Curtis Strong, as one of the dealers he purchased from. And then he implicated another player, Joaquin Andohar, who he said introduced him to a cocaine dealer. Andohar, a star pitcher for the league-leading St. Louis Cardinals, was just one of several newly named players fingered by Smith as having purchased and used cocaine. Baseball is not supposed to be on trial here. Keith Hernandez is not at first base tonight for the New York Mets. And but with more players lined up to testify, some fans may question that. Harold Dow, CBS News, Pittsburgh. In South exact location of closely guarded secret, they say their main fear now is that others may try to exploit their find for profit. For 73 years, no one has given much thought to who owns the wreck of the Titanic, but Tom Fenton in London tonight reports all that has changed. It was assumed the Titanic would never be seen again when the great ship went down on its maiden voyage in 1912. But the possibility of raising it is now being considered. Anything is possible if you throw enough money at it. Before that happens, they'll have to settle the question of who owns the Titanic now. Today, the Commercial Union Insurance Company of London dug out its files for 1912. It paid the original owners, White Star Lines, $5 million for the loss, but it doesn't own the wreck and doesn't know who does. So it could well be that it doesn't belong to anybody. The British shipping company Cunard says it didn't take over ownership of the wreck after buying out White Star Lines years ago, so it isn't theirs either. At Lloyd's of London, one of the member firms discovered today it had been part of the original syndicate that insured the supposedly unsinkable liner. But the Derougemont firm's $50,000 loss was long ago written off and forgotten. I, I don't think that the underwriters own the wreck, but... Uh... I doubt it's worth very much, anyhow, at the bottom of the ocean. As long as the Titanic remains on the bottom, none of the hard-headed businessmen in the city of London is showing much interest. But the minute there's a real prospect of salvage, there's likely to be a flood of claims. There's plenty down there to sell if they ever raise it. Not only jewelry, but souvenirs galore. 26,000 pieces of silverware, 46,000 pieces of china, not to mention the luxurious fittings. But with a likely price tag of several billion dollars for salvaging the vessel, they're going to have to find a lot of knives and forks and cups and saucers. 
Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. Ever since the 1970s... Vessel Noor, research vessel Noor, KXC 713 calling. Woods Hole here on Cape Cod has been in constant communication with its research vessel, the Noor. The center controls three vessels, but it was the Noor that found and photographed the Titanic. We went in and did, a, uh, I think, uh, the most spectacular photography one could do. And uh, I think the world will be very uh, happy to see what we did. Over. This research center is the largest oceanographic institution in the country. With a $50 million annual budget from the federal government, it developed the Argo, the sensitive cameras that filmed the Titanic two and a half miles underwater. It also developed the Alvin submarine that can take three men to that same depth and withstand the pressure. The Alvin might be used next year to take a more personal look at the Titanic. For Woods Hole, the discovery of the Titanic is just the latest chapter in the involved story of the sea. What we want, what I hope will emerge from that, is a recognition of what we can do in the ocean so that we have not just this one day of glory, if you like, but a continuing recognition of how important this kind of development, this kind of information can be. John McKenzie, ABC News, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And that's our latest news. John? So the wrecked Titanic are in. Terry Drinkwater tells us how they give the scientists something that had stubbornly eluded them. From the depths, today's new images of the Titanic showed the incredible force with which she hit the bottom of the ocean. It is now certain that the aft section was broken away from the forward hull. But with some mariner's luck, the missing section was found 200 feet away and photographed just before the expedition ended and the research ship had to leave the waters two and a half miles above the wreck. The first picture is the base of one of the after cranes. The significance of this is that we, we have located the stern. The second one is a boom and pivot housing of one of the after cranes to verify that part of the ship. So all of the major parts of the Titanic have now been found most well preserved on the pitch dark ocean floor. But still, as the expedition leader, Robert Ballard, told us from the USS Noor tonight, there is a vast area unexplored by the robot sub between the forward and aft sections of the ship. The third picture is a starboard crane with the boom of the port crane uh, coming into view, but not totally. So it's taken just at the base of the bridge. The fourth picture is the bow while looking at the port side. It's a, it's a very pretty picture. Uh, I would say it's the, the best uh, to just say, yes, that's the Titanic. It's the bow uh, looking at the port side with two capstans and a port and starboard uh, chain. Imagine a, a big ship and you're looking down and you see the chain that would go to the anchors uh, uh, running out. Today, the French and the American men who found the Titanic will celebrate. For 73 years, scores of others have tried and failed to accomplish what they did. Tonight also, they said prayers for the 1,500 who went down with the ship. Next summer, the expedition leaders plan to be back here in the North Atlantic. They will try to use a manned submarine to begin detailed exploration of the Titanic and to see the ship for the first time with their own eyes. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, St. John's, Newfoundland. West Germany. For women filed a formal complaint with the Federal Communications Commission today against ABC and CBS. The two networks have refused to accept a public service announcement about birth control. Now, says the networks have a special responsibility to air the ad because they emphasize sexual themes in entertainment programming. An ABC spokesman says the proposed ad did not fit ABC's policy for public service time. Well, there was certainly something of a thunder Something good can result from even the worst tragedy. The sinking of the supposedly unsinkable Titanic set in motion a series of changes having to do with the safety of traveling over water. Bill Blakemore, who has the details on that, begins with the latest pictures today from the ocean floor. We're looking straight down on the forward deck section of the Titanic in front of the bridge. Visible are the distinctive cranes of the Titanic used to lift passengers' luggage up from dockside and down into the hold. One cargo boom is extended, another folded in. 
Color pictures of much closer detail will be released next week. These pictures are meant to reconfirm for the world that it is the Titanic, highly preserved more than two miles down, where it's been sitting ever since that night 73 years ago, April the 14th, 1912. Three dots, three dashes, three dots, SOS. It was the first SOS ever radioed from a ship, and all around the failing Titanic, the entire North Atlantic night soon filled with the halting dots and dashes of those first radios just recently installed on ships. It created the first instantaneous North Atlantic community. The Titanic's radio operator, Jack Phillips, who kept transmitting till the last possible moment and drowned, became an international hero. At the tiny center of the great crisis, his sending key had shown how the new wireless signals could stitch together the patchwork of the world's nations. And there was negative proof of wireless power. A few miles from the Titanic, the SS California, which could have come and saved so many, did not, only because its radio was routinely switched off at 11.30 p.m., minutes before Titanic brushed the iceberg. Because of this, 24-hour monitoring of emergency frequencies was begun. The world's biggest ship going down taught that the exciting new mass transport clearly would also need mass safety. The Titanic's lifeboats were enough for only half those on board, and that was never allowed again. Lifeboat drills became mandatory for crews and passengers. The International Ice Patrol was created to make sea lanes safer, and never again would a ship be allowed to speed through ice fields as the Titanic had done. As for the word unsinkable, Titanic's builders had overlooked the fact that without watertight tops, each supposedly watertight hull section could spill over into the next. Within a year, Titanic's identical sister ship, the Olympic, was given genuinely watertight sections. It's one of the great lessons of overconfidence, the dangers of overconfidence and arrogance and uh, feeling that you've got all the answers when you don't really have all the answers at all. But the Titanic's hard lessons for the new technologies of mass transport and broadcasting were matched by its timeless lessons for the soul. Those men who stepped back from the lifeboats. Those partings with certain knowledge. Those wives who stayed with their husbands. And the moral failures. The Titanic's company president, Bruce Ismay, who quietly slipped into one of the lifeboats he'd been helping to launch, who struggled through the public investigation, then retired in shame for the last lonely 24 years of his life. What we've seen this week in the freezing depths of the Atlantic reminds us that those legends of the great ship Titanic were real. Bill Blakemore, ABC News, New York. A very exciting week of discovery. When we come back... only $9.99. All this and more at Macy's Home Design Sale Friday and Saturday. On a typical day at Belmont, we pay out $2 million in winnings. That's my job, putting money into people's pockets. And right now at Belmont, you have a new way of winning. It's the pick six. Pick six winners in a row, and a $2 bet could make you rich, and you won't have to wait 20 years to collect. Remember, when you win, it's good business for both of us. New York's winning at Belmont Park. It's a fact. Temperatures to end the work week. Lots of heat and humidity for the plains to the east coast with fall coming on strong all to the north and for much of the west. Joan? Thank you, Dave. Eight minutes before eight. For the past few days, we've been getting images of the wreck of the Titanic. The luxury liner is finally revealing some of her mysteries now after 73 years of silence. Walter Lord has had a lifelong love affair with the Titanic story. He wrote that story in a book, A Night to Remember, and last Tuesday he joined us, uh, joined us to share his very first impressions of the discovery. We've asked him back to share some of his feelings now that he's really been looking at all these pictures. This must be incredible for you. You've been on our show before talking about it, and now here it is. It's fascinating, Joan, just to, to see it actually in, in, in the pictures. What's been the most surprising thing about this discovery for you? For me, it's uh, and, and the, what marvelously clean shape she's in that, after all these years and that lying on the bottom of the sea. I always had heard that once, uh, uh, if you 
go deep enough and it's cold enough that things are perfectly preserved, but uh, I never thought it would be as sharply preserved yeah. as it is. Are there any mysteries that are particularly unique for you? I, well, the, 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 so far, and we haven't seen very many of the pictures, uh, the, the, what, the, 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 what impresses me the most is uh, that it confirms a theory that I've been developing uh, for several years and which I hope to mention in a new little book I'm doing on the Titanic. A new little book, which you're <laughs> going to have a new chapter in, right? Exactly. <laughs> but bet. this confirms a thought of, that I've been getting and having, and that is that she was much more break she was in much more worse shape when she finally plunged under than I thought she was when I wrote A Night to Remember. Yeah, because they haven't found the stern, right? No, exactly. The stern is missing. And there did seem to be a definite major structural break, just piecing together the accounts of the survivors in their testimony at the hearings. And lo and behold, the stern is missing. So uh, in a way, I feel elated that all of my uh, labors uh, seem to be confirmed. On the other hand, the picture does it so easily, and I, know. I, I right, was speculating all these times. Let's look years. at a few of the pictures. We've got the, the first uh, picture, I believe, is of the hull where the, they ram the iceberg. Now, do you think that perhaps because it was considered an unsinkable ship, that perhaps they didn't take as many cautions as they should have? I, uh, they were so careless, uh, everybody. Uh, some, uh, really? I've been asked several times, if you had to point the finger of blame at one individual, who would you choose? Uh, it was, that would be the most unfair thing to do in the world because they were all so careless. They were all so complacent. Uh, it wasn't so much that they thought she was unsinkable because they didn't want to hit an iceberg even if she didn't sink. Yeah. But they just weren't paying attention. All right. The next picture, I believe, is of Captain Smith's window. What, what kind of a man was he? Captain Smith was the benign patriarch of the Atlantic at the time. Uh, he was uh, the senior captain of the White Star Line. I think he had been in, ca uh, in the service of the White Star Line for 38 years. Uh, he, was, he had his own special following of passengers. A little personal note, if I may, uh, my mother was undecided about um, uh, whether she wanted to get married or not, and my grandfather sent her abroad to, so she could make up her mind on the Atlantic trip. And he insisted that she go on a ship with Captain Smith as the captain. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure it was a good idea right. in the light you, of what we know now. Do you think we should salvage this ship? No, I don't. Yeah. I, I think it's wonderful to explore it and discover it and so on, but a major salvage job, it, I, I regard it as, as something that should be allowed to stay where it is, although very much the way we made a wonderful decision in letting the Arizona stay where it is in Pearl Harbor. It had been perfectly easy to have brought up the Arizona and ha had a big pageant. But we didn't. We did it in perfect taste, and I would hope that something like that would govern our decisions on the Titanic. Walter Lord, thank you for being with us, and we'll look for that. The next perfect one. mission. The scientists who discovered the wreck of the Titanic have released the clearest photos yet of the giant ocean liner and made one last discovery. The crew of the SS Noor is headed home tonight, but before they left the spot where the Titanic sank 73 years ago, they managed to find the ship's missing stern section. Photos released today include this shot of the Titanic's rear assembly. It was found separate from the main wreck, leading scientists to believe the stern section broke away as the ship settled to the bottom. Also shown, the clearest shot yet of the Titanic's flag mast. The pennant of the White Star Line is gone. The crew of the NOR also photographed a forward crane assembly. It was twisted and bent probably as the ship sank and hit bottom. And an overhead view of the unsinkable Titanic. This is the bow of the ocean liner, anchor chains lying on the deck in straight lines, the Titanic, a museum piece, sitting upright more than 12,000 feet underwater. All along, the crew of the SS Noor has been calling the discovery of the Titanic an unexpected bonus. The real purpose of their voyage had been to test newly developed underwater cameras. Tonight, James Nelson looks at those cameras, technology that lets man take snapshots more than two miles below the sea. Taking pictures thousands of feet down in the darkness of ocean water does not come easily, but Colmex Systems Engineering knows how to do it. In finding the Doom luxury liner Titanic, Colmex TV cameras, lights, and control units were used, all just like these. It's sophisticated and all very essential, but perhaps it's the underwater eye or camera, the ability to see so deep in the ocean that intrigues most people. Under good lighting conditions, it's easy to see an individual or object on camera, like you're seeing me now. But when the lights go out, most cameras see nothing. But Colmex specially designed cameras 
offer a good image. What you're seeing now is a picture in total darkness. When any low light hits their special camera face, a device utilizing fiber optics multiplies that light, amplifying any image it does see by as many as 1,000 times. The, the TV camera has a specially designed uh, image tube in it. It has an image intensifier mounted in front of your regular image tube like your camera. So in other words, it has a light amplifier which has an order of, of, of uh, two or three magnitude of light amplification. So, uh, so that's the whole key to the low light level uh, situation. To withstand the tremendous water pressure, high strength steel casings are used and the sensitive wires are kept submerged in oil filled cables. But they work in depths up to 30,000 feet, which is why Comec officials were confident when looking for the Titanic. We, we sincerely felt that if uh, they were in the area, any kind of area, in other words, if they got in the area of the Titanic, uh, this instrumentation would find it. Colmec provides the same technology for U.S. Navy submarines, ocean mining firms, and others. They expect even more business now that the role... In our next segment. Ain't we got fun? Not much money, oh, but honey. Ain't we got fun? three, four, or seven-day cruise on Carnival, the most popular... You ...how long ago the 60s were, Ringo Starr is a grandfather. He was the first Beatle to become so when his son Zach and his wife Sarah had a baby girl. Ringo is now 45. And finally this evening, the Navy ship that found the Titanic. It came home today to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. As ABC's John McKenzie reports, the research vessel, Nor, got quite a reception. From the moment she passed through Nantucket Sound, the Noor was cheered home. She had spent only three weeks in the North Atlantic, but for many of those on board, it was a journey of a lifetime. Today, the 26 crewmen and 23 scientists showed off their floating laboratory, and that new set of cameras, the Argo, that found and photographed the Titanic two and a half miles underwater. With the Noor back in port, this was the first time the whole crew could tell their stories of just when and how they found the Titanic. Everybody was getting pretty um, tired of just looking and getting, basically bracing themselves for not finding it. But at 1.15 in the morning, the pictures from down below suddenly showed a ship's boiler. I ran into the van and there was a, there was a video still up on the monitor and it was undeniably part of the Titanic. And uh, it was quite a moment. And they pulled out some of the history books and they counted the bolts on the boiler and the open hatches. And the hatches matched and the bolts matched. And uh, then things kind of lost control. I mean, we were happy for ourselves that we'd made the discovery, but we also were very cognizant of, of what we had done and, and uh, the people down there. Those on board that night then held a memorial service for the 1,500 people killed on the Titanic. The chief scientist on this mission says he plans to travel down to the Titanic in a submarine next year, but he insists the ship should not be raised. It is a quiet and peaceful place and a fitting place for the remains of this greatest of sea tragedies to rest. Forever may it remain that way, and may God bless these now found folk. John McKenzie, ABC News, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And that's our report on World News Tonight. Before we go, we'd like to welcome a new affiliate station in Fresno, California. KFSN-TV, Channel 30. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night. From ABC, this has been World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. ship lying at the bottom of the Atlantic. The men who led the expedition that found the Titanic now says the 1,500 people who died when that ship went down could have been saved. Steve Handelsman has more from Washington. She sank in 1912 and was never seen again until last week. Miss Boom 
had fallen over and smacked into the port side of the bridge. Robert Ballard, oceanographer and explorer, found Titanic using the research ship Knorr and an advanced submersible camera craft. Today at the National Geographic Society, Ballard released pictures of the wreck which, after 73 years, bring Titanic almost back to life. This is the bow up here. You're now stepping down into this area, and there's the uh, entrance to the cruise quarters. Most of that crew and most of the wealthy passengers of Titanic died in the North Atlantic, leaving behind their wine bottles and their serving platters. And questions, could nearby ships, especially the steamship California, have rescued Titanic passengers? The California's captain said he was too far away to help. But the research ships found Titanic much closer than previously believed to where the California was located. They were uh, inside of 10 miles, perhaps as close as five miles. They should, have, they should have responded, in my mind, gone over there and rescued those people. Just tragic. While historians debate what might have been done to save the passengers of the Titanic, here at the Geographic Society and at the Navy, efforts continue to save the wreck itself. The coordinates are still secret. If they got out, it would be easy to send a boat there, to run down a claw, and to start pulling up souvenirs. In Washington, this is Steve Handelsman, News 4, New York. The wreck of the Titanic is sitting beneath 13,000 feet of water about 500 miles off the coast of New York. thing in the world right now would be to point to Pete Rose and say it was obvious all along there's the man that's gonna break Ty Cobb's record you gotta be kidding it would be untrue why well for one thing the way Pete Rose plays the game would have led you to wonder how long is this guy gonna last <laughs> I mean, Charlie Hustle, as he is nicknamed, never spared his body. He always went all out. And the real wonder is that he's lasted this long. Obviously, the body he has is special. And that's why he not only got 3,000 hits, but there was that day when he got to 3,500 hits. A memorable day. And then the day he passed the great Stan Musial in base hits. And then on the 4,000 hits. Do you realize? He's only the second man in the history of baseball to get over 4,000 hits. And now he has finally passed a mark that was considered absolutely impregnable. The mark set by the incomparable Ty Cobb. 4,191 hits. Rose has surpassed it. Yes, the Italian phrase, la forza del destino, the force of destiny, absolutely describes this man who was destined to do it. Pete Rose. This is Bill Mazur, Channel 5 News. All right, I already mentioned to you that Bill is in St. Louis tonight. Cardinal Terra said it was too far away to help. Really was very close to the Titanic. Ballard also had some pictures to show reporters today, and they really are incredible. Eric Rabe reports. The Titanic pictures were only released after a legal dispute was resolved with the French researchers who shared in the discovery. The French had gone to court yesterday. This view, looking down, shows several deck layers. The rectangle to the right is an awning over the ship's control room window. There's a gaping hole where the frontmost smokestack should have been. Incredible detail of anchor chains on the bow, still not covered with silt during 73 years, 13,000 feet underwater. This is the, what was the skylight over the grand, the grand staircase into the grand ballroom, first class smoking. This is a, the most beautiful part of the Titanic is right in this area. 
And here's the deck outside the crew's quarters. Those who slept here were among the 1,500 who died on this ship. The exact shipwreck location was not disclosed. Ballard says, though, a nearby ship, the California, was much closer than official records indicate. Perhaps within five miles, no the California the could have rescued many victims. That, uh, that tragedy needn't have existed. People had, needn't have died. They should have, they should have responded, in my mind, gone over there and rescued those people. Ballard and Woods Hole have no plans to raise the shipwreck. Indeed, Ballard today endorsed a bill now in Congress to make the site an international memorial. Uh, it belongs where it is, and it should remain where it is. And there are countless pieces of history preserved in the deep sea, and I think now they're just going to have to adjust to the fact that we're going to find more and more pieces of history, and those pieces of history should be protected. Ballard hopes to take more pictures of the Titanic next summer. For now, he heads for the Pacific and scientific research, leaving behind the latest controversy over the sunken liner, whether the Titanic ought to be raised. Eric Rabe, Metro Media News. Robert Ballard says another ship, the Californian, was only five or ten miles away when the Titanic began sinking in 1912. But the captain of the California said he was more than 20 miles away, and he wouldn't have had enough time to rescue any passengers. 1,500 lives, but tonight there is new word that the many who died when the Titanic went down might have been saved. Today, the leader of the team that found the doomed luxury liner revealed that another ship, the California, misstated its position. It was just five miles away when the Titanic sank, but failed to come to the rescue. People had, needn't have died if they'd only responded to those distress flares. They should, have, they should have responded, in my mind, gone over there and rescued those people. Ballard also released these incredible underwater photos of the wreckage, eerie reminders of the passengers who met a watery grave. These are the ship's railings where many people jumped overboard in desperation. Here, a silver tray from the private dining room where millionaires ate in luxury. And amazingly enough, wine bottles still stand on the ocean floor where the Titanic went down more than 70 years ago. Warner Wolf is next. With In our cover story this morning, the Titanic, the scientist who found her and a woman who survived the sinking 73 years ago. And the latest pictures of the ship, the best yet, from her resting place deep in the Atlantic. There you see the side railing still intact, unbroken wine bottles resting on the ocean floor, and a silver serving tray, now 73 years old, surrounded by chunks of coal. Dr. Robert Ballard led the expedition that found the Titanic. And Louise Pope was on board that April night in 1912 when the luxury liner sank. Both join us now from our Washington Bureau. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Let me begin with you, Dr. Ballard. I know finding the Titanic has been a lifelong obsession of yours. Is the feeling now that the world has been lifted from your shoulders, or is there a little sadness mixed in with that? Well, there is a, a, a sadness, I think, in the sense of the expedition itself and the 10-year effort that's gone into it. It's been in front of me, and now it's behind me, and one doesn't really know what to, what to do next now. So it's a little bit of a letdown. Actually, it is. You took something like 12,000 photos in this expedition, many of which you showed at your press con conference yesterday. Could you show us some more that really depict what you think are the best pictures of this ship so far? Fine. Well, we're going to travel from the bow uh, uh, aft, and the picture we have now is uh, right in the bow, and you see the chains uh, that are used to raise and lower the uh, anchors and the uh, winches that, that winch the anchors in and out. Mm -hmm. And this was taken with a uh, high-resolution 35-millimeter camera, and we were only about uh, 15 or 20 feet above the Titanic when it was taken. They're so precise. Well, it's shot with a very, uh, very good lens, uh, and this is a shot looking right down the number one stack uh, that was uh, lost uh, during the sinking, and uh, just uh, forward of that is the bridge area. Now, you have pictures of the wine bottles that we, we saw earlier and the, the, a lot of the things that were actually on board, correct? Yeah, now, this, this particular photograph is where the Titanic's intact. The wine bottles and the uh, plate and the other images that you showed before are about 800 meters uh, to the south of the Titanic. I'd be curious, Mrs. Pope, what is your feeling when you look at these pictures? What do you think about? Well, it's, I'm just wondering how much of that is going to be able to be seen further. I don't know just what to expect. 
That brings up the point of salvaging this ship. Dr. Ballard has mentioned in the past, Mrs. Pope, that he does not think it should be salvaged. Do you? No. Why not? What is there left? Well, there's that entire ship there and a lot of the things that were on it. Well, the only thing I always said is they could bring the valuables up, like the jewels and the money, why, that would be fine. <laughs> that would be fine with you. Let me ask you about that, Dr. Ballard. A lot of people have said that it's almost inconceivable not to think that people will go out in search of this ship, will go out in search of the valuables that you say are there, that Mrs. Pope has said that she believes are there, many p people believe are there. How can you stop people from doing this? Well, I don't know if you can really stop them, uh, except... Uh trying to get the countries that were involved, France and the United States, to, to do whatever they can to work with their North Atlantic neighbors who, who surround the Titanic site. It's very much like uh, finding a, a pyramid that you uh, have not uh, had grave robbers go in and, 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 and rob. And that's the way I feel about it. I just think what a marvelous uh, situation would be if we could go back into Egypt and other historical sites and see see all the artifacts and see everything uh, in their right place. And I just hope that we can somehow uh, rise above the way we've behaved in the past and uh, preserve the Titanic. But because of these pictures, because of the description you yourself have given, people are so curious about this. They're so fascinated. It's like a story right out of the history book. How can you stop that feeling? How can you stop people's interest in this and say, listen, it's down there, but leave it alone? I think if we continue the, uh, the photography work that we've been doing, uh, today's uh, imaging systems uh, are able to give you a sense of presence. I think people would much rather uh, go into the Grand Ballroom with a robotic vehicle and look at the, look, uh, at the Grand Ballroom than to uh, bring it back up and uh, take pieces of it and send it here and send it there. In your press conference yesterday, you said something that a lot of people were surprised at. You said nobody need have perished on this ship. Could you be more specific? Well, that's always been a controversy uh, dealing with the California, and uh, we really didn't know where the Titanic had ultimately landed, so we really couldn't uh, ascertain where it hit. But now that we know where it rests, we can pretty well estimate where it hit the iceberg, and with that, uh, determine where the California really was. And uh, the California was really a lot further south than it was reported. Mrs. Pope, how do you feel about that? You lost some, uh, two members of your own family on this ship. When Dr. Ballard says nobody should have died on that, what is your reaction to that? Well, if they would have filled the boats more, I think they would have been a lot more saved. But uh, they were in such a rush that the boats were only filled halfway. Mm -hmm. And in that way, of course, there was a lot more people drowned where they would have probably been saved. If you could have, had, if you could have anything off of this ship, what would you want? My bicycle your bicycle <laughs> that's it did you see any bicycles down there dr ballard no bicycles uh but uh i wouldn't be surprised that uh, we couldn't find them are you surprised at all the attention this has caused this discovery all the attention on you well uh is, yeah i wasn't really prepared for what, what what took place i uh i knew the world would be interested and excited about finding the titanic uh, but i did not expect this sort of reaction. Okay, well thank you both for joining us very much this morning, Dr. Ballard and Mrs. Pope, and I'm sure we have not heard the end of the story of the Titanic. Thank you. Just for last year's Molson IndyCar Racer.